Good evening, welcome to Horizons. And uh, we'll welcome back to uh, Ben Emlyn Jones from uh, Hospital Porters Against the New World Order with Real Zombies, the horror to come. It's all quite scary. Ben looks at zombies, the dead but not dead, and examines their popularity in entertainment, where a great deal of effort and money is used to portray these creatures as real. Do they know something we don't? Let's find out. Please welcome Ben Emily Jones. Hospital Port has tried and didn't see. Stop the new world order. Yeah. Yeah. Good. How many hospital reporters here today? Have I come to the right meeting? <laughs> ah, I'm at that New Horizons. Never mind, I hope you'll let me stay. Yeah, um, in fact, thanks, thanks all of you for coming. This is really, really it would be a great show. When I'm here, I'm usually known as the David Icke of the North. It's, uh, people say I sound like him. I don't think I sound like David Icke at all. If, if you think I do, then it's just a coincidence, nothing to worry about. But anyway, um, who am I? As uh, Rob said, my name is Ben Edmund Jones, and uh, this uh, was me for most of my life, actually. I was a hospital porter at the John Radcliffe in Oxford, yeah, big teaching hospital, one of the biggest in the country, a thousand plus beds, general teaching hospital. Uh, it's a job I did for a long time, the great pride. Um, I got sat in what I think is very mis mysterious and suspicious circumstances. Um, in my last talk here, I went into that in more detail, but basically it's, it seems like more and more people are being attacked in the workplace if they have interests of the kind you would discuss at a meeting like this. So um, that's a long story, but basically um, you, there's lots of other people who suffer a similar fate. Tony Farrell, the police officer, there's um, Kevin Annett, the vicar from Canada, people like that, and um, who, who have lost their jobs. Just, is it a coincidence? I don't think so. Anyway, um, tonight what I want to talk about is scary and um, frightening. I'm not going to deny it, so you may find what you hear disturbing, but I don't want you to leave this room tonight feeling hopeless and feeling despondent and just thinking this horror is coming, there's nothing we can do. Hopefully we can stop this horror from coming. Um, there's no certainty about what I've discovered. All I know is there, is there are plans for some bad things to happen in this world, but the plans haven't started yet, and I think if people are talking about them and people are spreading the word, that's the best way of stopping them. And I feel confident we can actually stop them. Um, so we're a bit of a... So I want, to, I want you to leave with hope tonight. That's my intention. I hope I succeed. Um, we're in a bit of a strange world at the moment, of course. We used to have a World Cup. And um, Germany are sort of hoisting their, the cup high at the moment and really enjoying the limelight. But it could have been Uruguay if it wasn't for this. I mean, we all... Uh, we, this has been in the news a lot, hasn't it? Uh, Luis Suarez. Who uh, played for Uruguay, also played for Liverpool. Um, very hot headed, yes. I mean, a lot of, he's one of the world's top footballers, and like many top footballers, he, he's quite a hot headed chap. He, has, he loses his temper very easily, but he has a strange way of expressing his rage. He likes to bite people, and this is actually the third player he's bitten on during matches. Um, he, when he was playing for Ajax, he bit um, Otman Bacal of PSV Eindhoven when he was in a match. He bit a uh, Chelsea player only, only last season, and of course, in the World Cup a couple of weeks ago, he was Uruguay playing Italy, and then he was marking Giorgio Colini, that guy. <laughs> and just for no reason, how he was talking, he didn't ever bit him on the shoulder. And of course, um, if, I mean, the referee missed it. If, he, if the referee had seen it, he'd have got an instant red card. As it was, it was, it was of course, spotted on television, and he was banned for four months as a result of this misdemeanor. Um, and of course it's spawned no end of um, humorous, <laughs> humorous, uh, humorous little jokes. This is one of many of these tableaux that have come up comparing Luis Suarez to a zombie. But it's, it's interesting that the, the, the zombie theme keeps coming up again and again in our culture. And I, I actually predicted that this would happen, you get this comparison, because of course the, the need to, to bite other people, to eat other people, um, that is basically one of the hallmarks of the of the zombie as we know it today. But first of all, we need to go back to, to uh, the beginning, really, and explain exactly, explain exactly what a zombie is. Oh, yeah, 
I thought it was a show in the hat. You can now get your very own Louis Spire pop over. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it, this is the kind of um, this is the kind of world we're living in right now. So uh, you you know the idea of zombies, I think, is on everybody's mind, and it doesn't take long before people think of um, zombie-like ideas to uh, tease people with. But the zombie itself, um, you can all see that okay. Yeah, this is, um, this is an image of a zombie. The, zombie. the concept of the zombie originally is from Africa. It's from uh, various cultures in West Africa, and um, the actual word zombie comes from the Niga Congo language word, and zombie. And um, it was brought to the West by a slave trade from Haiti, where we, we emerged from Haitian voodoo, which is a religion which comes straight out of Africa. And, um, and basically what a zombie is, it's a corpse that has been reanimated by mystical means. Um, and the, the reanimation would be done by a sorcerer, a, a black shaman, known as a bokor. What the bokor would do is that the bokor would capture the soul of somebody who died in a bottle. And he'd he keep the bottle himself, he'd hide it somewhere in his house, or he'd dig a hole and bury it in the woods, or somewhere like that. And as long as he possessed that bottle, he possessed the soul of the person who died. But during that period of time, he also could control the body. The body could be reanimated as an undead, animated um, entity. And it would have no, no will or personality in the body. It would have no trace of the person, the, the personality or the soul of the person who occupied the body. And um, basically, you'll become like a robot, like a slave, which the bottle could use to um, do whatever he wanted and to keep for as long as he wanted. This, of course, was a part of voodoo. Um, voodoo is um, one of the um, oldest religious religions on earth, certainly in the Western world, and it exists on the island of Hispaniola in Haiti, which I think is the western half of that island. And the voodoo um, shamanic tradition is very, very old, and it's still going today. Now then, um, this guy is Wade Davis, and he is a, an anthropologist and ethnopharmacologist. Now repeat that back to me. <laughs> well done, mate, well done. <laughs> now, um, that's right. Um, what he did, he became very, very interested in a, in a story which he heard, which has been documented by someone called um, Clavius Narcisse. Now, Clavius Narcisse was uh, a man born in Haiti in 1922 and died, well, supposedly died, in 1962. The thing was, uh, Narcisse was buried in the local cemetery, along with all the other people who died in his village, <coughs> and um, his, the grave was rocked. People exhumed the body and ran off with it, and a few days later, Narcisse was seen walking around the village People came up to him, shocked and somewhat pleased to see him. They thought he was dead, and they, uh, but he, he didn't seem to recognise anyone. He was completely dazed. He, was, he seemed to be in a trance. He was just sort of ambling along, completely unaware of his surroundings. A local doctor checked him, and apparently he had no heartbeat and no pulse. So Wade Davis was very fascinated by this, and he actually took a trip to Haiti to examine um, the, the, um, where, where all this came from, this whole idea of the zombie in Haiti. And um, what he discovered was, he thought that the, the zombies were not actually dead bodies, they were living people who'd been poisoned, they'd been poisoned and people thought they were dead, buried them, and then the person who did the poisoning would dig them up, and, and this person would be dead, they'd be, it, they'd be so intoxicated by this, um, this substance they'd been given that they would be basically brain damaged. And that was what the Haitian zombie was. The poison used was called tetrodotoxin. It's extremely dangerous, and it can be found in pufferfish and toads. And once you have a lethal dose, there's no antidote that can save you. The um, shaman, the voodoo shaman, would use a sublethal dose to try and um, to, to put the person into a trance. Now, he, um, Wade Davis wrote a book called The Serpents and the Rainbow. And in 1988, Wade Davis played them made into a horror movie. And here's a still of the movie. This is the DVD of the film. Um, it's uh, Wes Craven, The Serpent and the Rainbow, based on a true story. And that's the last thing you want to read on the cover of a, a horror film, isn't it? But um, you'll be glad to know if you watch this film, you'll be very glad to know that uh, Craven is actually quite economical with the facts. So uh, it's not quite as bad as it appears in this movie. So a fascinating movie to watch. It does contain a lot of factual information that um, is found in the book. 
Now, um, in the 20th century, the zombies became uh, become a large part of um, the fictional world, both in literature and in the cinemas. Now, the first um, the first time it appeared was there was a uh, H.P. Lovecraft, the famous horror writer, included zombie-like themes in his stories. And it was Richard Matheson, who I think died a couple of years ago. He's a more recent writer. The first ever book to mention the word zombie was the novel um, Magic, The Magic Island by W.B. Seabrook. And uh, the world's first zombie movie was White Zombie in 1932, directed by Victor Halperin and Star Bernard Lugosi. But, but really, the definitive and seminal film, which really caused the concept of the zombie to emerge into our culture, came in 1968. And it was this one, Night of the Living Dead by George A. Romero. Um, it, it really popularised the image of the zombies we know it today, in terms of the eating, eating the flesh, hunting humans and eating the flesh, and things like that. Um, this was the first of a six film series that spanned 42 years. And uh, this is still from some of the other movies. This is from um, Dawn of the Dead, 1978. This is the first sequel. The best, I think this is the best of the series, actually. Um, it's, it's about a group of people who, it's sort of like a, a follow-on from the original Night of the Living Dead. It follows another group of survivors who they have to hold up in a shopping center where these zombies are attacking them from all sides. It's a really, really interesting film. Really, really, very, very good. This is another still from um, Dawn of the Dead. And this poor fellow here has been bitten by a zombie, and of course, he turns into one. He was originally one of the human cast, but he's, bit, he's been bitten by a zombie, so he becomes one of them. This is one of the nasty things about the remake of the zombie. This is from Day of the Dead. As you see, that is the zombie that's eating, and what the thing, what it's eating there, unfortunately, is a human body. Now, this is still from Land of the Dead, 2005. After Day of the Dead in 1985, Romero didn't do anything for 25 years, and he came back, and he came back in style. Land of the Dead is an excellent film, and that's uh, one that still from there. The zombies become gradually more intelligent through the series, which is, um, which is unusual when you think about it, but they do sort of develop more kind of awareness as time goes on. Now, um, what, what Romero popularised was, the, along with his particular brand of zombie, which became how we see zombies, was the idea of the zombie apocalypse. And this was a form of, dy a form of dystopian fiction. Like, um, you had th things like Mad Max, which is, and um, post-nuclear post post war apocalyptic mm -hmm. scenes and things like that. This is the, the zombie apocalypse was different. The zombie apocalypse is where there was a breakdown in society as a result of a zombie outbreak. And um, what would happen is the zombies would spread, it's usually a global thing, they spread across the world, gradually increasing in number, and, and civilization would break down. The uh, military law enforcement would be swamped, um, society would collapse, the infrastructure, that's a word you'll hear a lot of nowadays, infrastructure. The infrastructure would break down, and there'd be nothing left except a, a few pockets of survivors who basically had to scavenge for supplies and food, and of course defend themselves from the zombies all the time, which outnumbered them many times. Many so, um, in 2004, Dawn of the Dead was remade. In my view, it wasn't nearly as good as the original. Um, although it did have a zombie baby, and that really freaked me out. If you haven't watched that movie, I'll tell you. Um, and um, also, the, the zombies in the remake of Dawn were, were totally different because they, they were much more agile. They could run around, they could jump, and they could run really fast. And that somehow made them less scary, I think. Not as good as the original uh, film, the original Romero S. Zombie. The Romero S. Zombie is the classic zombie. It's, it's basically it's the corpse that has been reanimated, very often through, um, through means which are not explained to the viewer. In Romero, you're never told what that is. Um, basically, it's, it's, it's very great. It's rather like the one from African mythology. It's, it's just a mindless, undead being which has no personality. Um, it's, it can't walk, it just walks very slowly, it sort of stumbles and staggers along, it appears dazed, semi-conscious, never speaks, it just sort of moans and grunts, but it's extremely dangerous because it's always hungry, the only thing it wants to eat is the flesh of living humans, and its only objective is to hunt down and eat humans. 
Um, and as I said in Romero, there's sometimes little hints about what might be causing it, but you never ever, and you're never actually told why these zombies are appearing. There's just one little clue in Dawn of the Dead, and one of the characters says that um, when there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. And, that's, and that actually became the subtitle of the film when it was released onto video and DVD. Now, sci-fi horror. Zombies have emerged from sci-fi horror as well. Mostly, mostly in the post-2000 era, you get a number of science fiction horror films which feature zombies. In this case, the viewer is told the cause, usually, and that cause is scientifically explicable. It's not, they're not supernatural. These zombies are called, created by a disease, a virus, or another kind of infectious agent which spreads as a kind of plague, turning people into zombies. Now, this is, a good, this is an example of one of the best ones, actually, Iron Legend. There's Will Smith there, starring, and um, one of the zombies that is in this post-zombie post apocalypse world that he lives in. Um, this one from this side of the Atlantic, up, um, 28 days later. Again, this is a very interesting one as well, because it features this virus, this, uh, this virus that spreads very quickly. And it's quite scary because in this case it spreads through the air. And um, Resident Evil. Now, this is actually a series of films. There's six of these movies now, and there's another one coming out very soon. Um, this is the most interesting one of all. I'm going to come back to Resident Evil later on. Um, this is, um, in this case, again, it's a sci fi horror. The, the zombies are very Romero esque. In the classic sense, but the, the actual themes of it are very, very interesting. And amazingly, it's, it's, it's based on a computer game. And there aren't many, um, there aren't many, you don't get any of these films that are based on computer games. Um, but so it's, it's pretty good. I don't, I've got no prejudice against things based on computer games. And zombies have been on TV as well, they become a theme on television. And this here is Darren Brown, his Dex here. No, oh, Dex had personal experience with the powers of this man. Um, he, Darren Brown, of course, he's a hypnotist, a mentalist. He can mess with people's minds. He does it for entertainment purposes only, which is just as well, because there's many other people who have his skills which use it, use it, they use it for much more malevolent purposes. But uh, Darren Brown actually has created several TV shows, and one of them was a reality TV horror called Apocalypse. I think it only came out last year. Um, have any of you seen it? You've seen Apocalypse, you, you have, John. It's, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's, a very, it's, it's one of his most controversial productions ever. It's a strange blend of uh, one of the Romero film, The Truman Show, and Jeremy Kyle. You've got a, you've got a picture in your head, it's something like that. But what, what he did was, because he's, uh, because he's a bit arrogant, this chap, in fact, he's very arrogant, he, he decided to um, educate somebody he thought was Living a thoughtless existence without caring for the people around him. Very unambitious, dispassionate, slowful, and immature. An overgrown teenager who didn't clean up his room and he made his mother do all his washing and cooking for him. He had trouble keeping a job and spent all his free time down the pub. This was a man called Stephen Brosnan. What, what Brown did was he targeted this guy, he hypnotized him, and made him think he was living in a zombie apocalypse. So he's a bit of a slob, he's a, obviously, obviously that's a fault of his, but does that mean he deserves to believe his world is destroyed and his family dead? I mean, this is, you know, Darren Brown says he, he said, um, he hoped that uh, by using everything he took for granted, Brosnan would discover a new lease of life, he'd develop courage, compassion and decisiveness. He'll be a man changed for the better. Now, many critics say, you know, that's saying that Darren Brown has gone too far, and I agree. Um, I find all reality TV very ugly and unpleasant. This one is the, is the worst. I mean, he's Darren Brown, he's made people think they're living in a haunted house. He's given them out a pill to cure him with his sphere of spiders, things like that. This is, this is just goes beyond the joke, I think. Mean. Um, there's also a rumour that um, the whole thing was staged, and I hope it was, and that Stephen Brosnan was a stooge, the man that Brown targeted. And I, I spoke to a guy I know about this, because he was a solicitor, and he said, it has to be staged. You could not make a real program like that. Because kidnapping someone and hypnotizing them and putting them through that ordeal is tantamount to it's tantamount to assault and kidnapping and this guy could have just gone straight to the police as soon as he was out of the program and could have had the whole production scene arrested. 
So um, that's uh, what I suspect is. I suspect at each stage, actually. Um, there's, some people have said that Guy Williams was an actor and they've recognised him as an actor. And this is World War Z. It's a poster for World War Z. Anyone seen this one? It was in the cinemas a few months ago. Yeah, it's uh, Danny, what's martial law? That's his tagline, little kid. The innocence of youth caught up in this appalling, appalling situation. Um, this is an interesting one. It's part of a sort of like series of post-2000 sci-fi zombie apocalypse horrors. Here's another uh, publicity, another publicity show for it. Um, Brad Pitt plays a hero who is um, this guy who's it's very interesting actually. There's some interesting themes because Brad Pitt is he works for the United Nations, and this is this is what bothers me about this film is the UN is portrayed as something heroic and. Organisations like the Centre for Disease Control and Prevention, which I'll, I'll be mentioning again tonight, come up, and the World Health Organisation. And um, it seems like it's the, the story is almost like propaganda for those organisations, portraying them as good. And as we'll see this evening in a minute, they're not good. And um, this film is trying to present them in a very nice light. And of course, at the moment, what's also in the news is the, the war that's broken out in Gaza or the bombardment of Gaza by the Israeli Defence Force. Israel is also portrayed as a very, very heroic entity in this film. Um, there's, uh, they, they built a wall around the, 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 the whole uh, country, and it's like they're the sort of like last bastion of civilization in the world. So there's a lot of Zionist propaganda in this film as well, and that disturbs me too. But um, that's World War Z, anyway. Now this is a book, it's not just film and book, it's books. This is Zombie Apocalypse by Stephen Jones and Ed Tower. I've got a copy, I've got a copy here actually, and um, this is a book which is, fits in with a lot of um, the kind of, it's pretty much based on very, very the same themes as in the films I've just been talking about. But it's very, very interesting, it's actually a sort of like anthology written by several different people. Um, it's an epistolary. Now, an epistolary is a, a book written, a story told by a series of letters. Um, like uh, Paul Scott's Raj Quartet. I don't know how many of you have read that, but uh, that's, a, that's a series of books written by a series of letters. It was made into the TV show Jewel in the Crown, the miniseries. Um, this is an epistolary too, but it's, um, of course, it, it's a, set in the modern day, in the modern age. Letters is not just pen on paper, it's things like emails, tweets, Facebook messages, blog posts, text messages, things like that. Dracula was written in that form as well. Was it? Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. I've oh, not read that book. But um, this is, uh, it says, um, the end of the world with flesh eating zombies in the near future. And it talks about how um, construction work on the site of an old church in South London releases a centuries old plague that turns its victims into flesh eating ghouls whose vital strife passes the contagion, a supernatural virus with the power to invite the dead onto others. So this is basically the Romero X kind of, it's the Romero sort of like. Um, package really in this book. Uh, what's interesting is it combines the supernatural with the sci-fi because it's a virus, but it's a supernatural virus created by a cultist. And it mentions Nicholas Hawksmoor, who's um, a real person actually. He's an architect that designed, who designed a lot of the churches you find in London. And um, some researchers into the occult and Freemasonry have, have said that Nicholas Hawksmoor actually encoded um, magical sort of like of symbols into the churches where they were laid out, things like that. So uh, this is a very, very interesting book indeed. There's a very, very vivid account of what would happen. What I'll do is, I'll leave this here and, and, uh, during the break, you can come, come and have a little flick through it if you like. But don't run off with it, because it belongs to my brother. Okay. And of course, whenever you get serious items, in the cinema and on bookshelves, you get the spoofs, you get comedies. And uh, there are plenty of zombie comedies around them. Um, parodies, spoofs, satire. This is probably the best one actually, Shaun of the Dead. Um, it's, a, um, it's basically a very, very affectionate parody for Romero and his films. And uh, it's got a Simon Pegger playing kind of hero. Um, there's many others as well, there's the Warm Bodies, there's um, this one called Decay. Um, you can, so in a sense they're like horrible, but they, they, they're funny and they often take the mickey out of the, the serious zombie films. I do recommend that very, very much. And there's some, 
And also, I mean, there's, there's a massive amount of fan. I mean, there's a fan base for zombie films and zombie flicks and zombie books and zombie culture in general. And there's fan clubs, there's conferences, and there's zombie walks. If any of you have seen a zombie walk, there was one in Nottingham a few months ago, where people basically got parades from the tram town dressed as zombies and walking and acting like zombies. And there's some really big ones. There's a big one in Warsaw in Poland, and there's a big one in Toronto, Canada, every year. And they have competitions for the best costume, the best acting, and things like that. It's, it's, it's a, lot, there's a lot of satire in the zombie culture, I think, to do with sort of like how people, people act. In, and that was a lot of Romero's points, actually. And I'm sure that's all zombies were um, for my whole life, really. And I think that's all they were to anyone. I didn't, didn't really think there was anything more to them than that. They were just entertaining. Um, a meme which you find in fiction, but there's actually something far more going on, and it's very, very alarming. It's, just, it's that zombies appear to be entering the real world in various different ways. I'll explain. Excuse me, to kill a zombie, you think it's salt, don't you? Oh, well, there's several, it depends which film it is, but mm -hmm. give them a certain type of salt. Well, I'll tell you what, you, 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 there's, there's serious plans being drawn up explaining exactly that. I'm not joking. This is. This is an article from The Guardian. Um, local authority reveals top secret plans for self-defense strategies should zombies invade. That's right. Um, Bristol City Council has outlined emergency plans for a local attack. This is not a joke. Local authorities routinely have, de have detailed emergency plans for natural disasters such as floods, and man-made atrocities like terrorist attacks. But according to a top secret plan revealed after a freedom of information request, Bristol City Council appears well prepared for a zombie attack. A Mr. P. Saw contacted the council wondering what plans have been laid down in case the undead invade. Rather than ignoring the request or dismissing it, an officer wrote back setting out the best ways to tackle the zombies and highlighting areas of the cities, city considered high-risk areas. Now, Peter Holt, the service director of communication and marketing, wrote back to Mr. Storr saying, In response to your request for details of Bristol City Council's contingency plans for dealing with the zombies, I can now release you the following strategy document. Please note that this document contains various redactions as it has been considered that some of the information contained therein must be redacted for the purposes of safeguarding national security. There are, there are four segments of, according to the Bristol City Council, categorises zombie activity. One, ambient zombie level, business as usual, but be on the lookout for telltale signs. Two, enhanced activity level, confirmed zombie attacks on the populace. Three, major outbreak, zombie infection level in excess of 1%, multiple sightings across the city. Four, zombie pandemic level, concentrated outbreak with infection levels over 30%. The report suggests certain parts of the city, like Whitchurch Park, Shirehampton, and Totterdown, are particularly at risk and adds that false positives have been found in Stokes Croft, the city's Bohemian quarter. It was the scene of riots this year after the opening of a new Tesco store. To avoid widespread panic, staff are asked to listen for code words on the radio and television to warn them that a zombie attack is underway. Under health and safety, the document urges staff to remember the correct zombie killing procedure. Um, fully connect the brain stem from the body or destroy, destroy the brain by gunshot or blunt head trauma. The report says that Bristol City Council staff, are, they're, they're, some staff are fully qualified and accredited with staff in, trained in zombie handling and they have annual refresher courses. Now, I checked the date, like it was 7th of July 2011, not, not April 1st. Can I, can I just say that in Shaun of the Dead, the, uh, the Collect the zombies and use them, uh, treat them, and use them as slaves afterwards in pets. But yeah, I think that's that's an issue. I'll be coming to that later. That's from, that's definitely something I've got to bring up. You know. Um, so is this really? Is what's going on? Is this really serious? I mean, the the, the council have given no reason really. It's given no um, explanation other than it's responding to a freedom of information ad request. Um, and it's breached this document, I think it made the decision itself to do that for reasons of national security. And I thought, if it's a joke, I mean, sometimes there are jokes in newspapers, but you can tell them. 
I mean, it's very obvious what is a joke and what is not by the tone. This has a tone of a serious, um, up a serious news story. What's more, the author is Stephen Morris, and he's not a novelty columnist, he's a serious reporter. Here's his bio, he comes from Wales, and he's he covered mostly things to do with in Wales and places like that. But he's, it's not the kind of jokes and frivolity is not the kind of thing he would normally write. He's not, he's not on the right entertainment page. And another thought I had was maybe the maybe the council was using some kind of code. That's what this is what it's all about. And that zombies might refer to say social disorder. For example, when they said there were false positives in the Stokes Trot area, that might refer to the riot that took place there. Um, of course, this is outrageous. You have no idea that they're actually literally true. It's outrageous. Is it, uh, do you think the reason finding the term zombie? Maybe. I'll, I'll come to that because that's an important point. I mean, it could be that they're trying to um, inject this, this sort of theme into society through psychological, for, for, as a psychological operation, or that it's literally true. I'm, I'll come to explore both these possibilities. But it got worse. Oh, it got so much worse. Preparedness 101 Zombie Pandemic, issued by the US Department of Health and Human Services, Centre for Disease Control and Prevention. This is, uh, this is a document that was published by the CDC, the very, very same organisation that's mentioned in World War Z, as a heroic um, you know, part, of, part of the army fighting back against the zombie hordes. Um, now, the CDC itself, yeah. Could, could this be why they've got all the FEMA camps in the States? Maybe, they've yeah. They've brought loads and loads of guillotines. It, yeah, it could. That's a good point. Guillotines, it could because, be. Because there's a thing online saying that they bought something like 4,000 guillotines or something like that. I know. And they've got all these FEMA camps ready, prepared for whoever's meant to go in. I think there's a connection here. I think there really is. But the, the CDC it dates back to 1946. It was originally, it was originally just the Centre for Disease Control. But now it's a Centre for Disease Control and Prevention. They have to the P bit afterwards. But uh, those, that's Orwellian. It's, very, it's a very Orwellian word because it's, it's, it's got nothing to do with control and prevention at all. It's actually infamous, actually, and it has a global reach. If you ever watched the film Outbreak with uh, Donald Sutherland and Morgan Freeman and Dustin Hoffman, that's a good film. That's worth watching. Um, now, the, the, the character who's central, central to this whole story is this man here who is um, uh, Rear Admiral Dr. Ali S. Khan. Now, he's the director of the Centre for Disease Control's Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response. And he writes a blog on the CDC website, and he is the man behind this Preparedness 101 scenario. And he said, take a zombie apocalypse. That's right, I said, zombie apocalypse. You may laugh now, but when it happens, you'll be happy you read this, and you never know, you might learn a thing or two about how to prepare for other emergencies. Possible pandemics of flesh-eating zombies from the horror films Night of the Living Dead and the video game series Revenant and Evil. Dr. Khan recommends that Americans plan for natural disasters as they would have prepared for ravenous monsters. And this is the uh, poster that came with it. And there's a couple more posts as well, I'll show you in a little while. But um, this is the, uh, can you all see that? It's uh, like a zombie face peeking over the, the curtains. And now, I'm assuming the metaphor. I think fracking might have some parts play in this. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Um, but this, um, I assume it was just a metaphor, and once it's done its point, you know, once it's made its point, they can go on to other matters. They don't. They, if they don't stop with, with the metaphor. They carry on talking about it as if it's not real. Oh, sorry, as if it is real. And it's the, it's the more credible threats. Things like tornadoes, hurricanes, terrorist attacks. <laughs> Those are more credible. Um, stop all the terrorist attacks slightly more. Um, they lead to, they carry on with the zombie theme. And um, Dr. Khan's blog includes, it, it, the blog he writes it includes precautionary advice about zombies. But in terms of our escape routes from the zombies, he said, um, if zombies start appearing on your doorstep, you need an evacuation route, which means you need to get out of town fast. Because zombies, when they're hungry, they won't stop until they, they get what they want food, living human flesh. 
Could plan where you go and have multiple routes ahead of time so the flesh is as though it churns. Um, it caused a bit of a sensation. In fact, the CDC's website crashed with all the attention. It had 30,000 hits an hour. Uh, by the, the day after it was published, it was a trending topic on Twitter. Um, there was this tagline, if you're ready for a zombie apocalypse, then you're ready for any emergencies. Um, it got 1.2 1. 2 million followers eventually. Now there's been a mixed reaction to it from the officials. I mean, the, um, the National Association of County and City Health officials in the USA, they, um, they, had, they were kind of, because um, this is centered on the United States, but of course the CDC has authority over the entire world, really. Um, they were, they were a bit more about the, the, the CDC budget and taxpayers' money has been spent in this way. Um, but it was a bit mixed. But the, the CDC carried on, even though there was a lot of criticism, and said um, they, they had a contest for the most creative and effective videos covering competitors for a zombie apocalypse. They encouraged, the, they encouraged all their readers to upload YouTube videos of what they were going to do to prepare for a zombie apocalypse. Um, they said, they, you know, all the zombie outbreaks, how would you cope if the undead arrived in your neighbourhood? And things like that. And then, and then they mentioned other emergency situations too, almost as an afterthought. And um, in October of 2011, the CDC published a zombie pandemic graphic novel. This is, um, this is the actual, this was actually written by Bob Hobbs, who's a, a famous fantasy artist. And um, basically, it tells the story of a, a nice all town American couple with a dog and a cat living this quiet life at home as we all want to do. Then they hear a knock at the door. There we go. They're talking about preparing the emergency zombie kit, and then the dog starts growling, the cat starts hissing. And they're thinking, who could it be? Could it be the nice old lady next door? Well, it is, but she turned into a zombie. And it's. <laughs> And then more and more zombies appear, and then um, later on, in the, uh, there's the CDC, the heroic CDC is portrayed in there, and uh, uh, Dr. Khan actually makes it an actual uh, personal appearance. There he is. So that's the uh, zombie pandemic um, novella. And then there's uh, some posters as well. This is, this is a small large PDF of the poster which um, came along. Don't be a zombie, be prepared. And this is the other one. You get all these from CDC's website. Get a kit, mental plan, be prepared. Very strange indeed, I must say. Thanks. So, uh, what's going on? What's the question? Um, now, the original blog document, which um, Dr. Khan wrote, is dated the 16th of May 2011, and it was published on the uh, Public Health Preparedness Response Agency of the HHS that same night. Now, Bristol City Council must have launched their own zombie, um, their own zombie program around about the same time, because the article I just showed you was dated July of that same year. So the question is, what does this mean? If is is this, do they mean it literally, or is this some kind of psychological warfare attack on us all? I mean, if so, it's a very peculiar one, because people have said that maybe it's all about some kind of, it's, it's meant to symbolise something like terrorism. Well, they already have a lot of propaganda to make us afraid of terrorists. You know, these guys with beards and shirt tails, who run around the street screaming, you know, we've all got to see it, they're under your bed, you know, they've got cans of Mr. Sheen, which is spraying the bonnet play everywhere. They will, see, you should watch this, the CDC website has all this kind of stuff on it. So in a sense, it, it seems that any other kind of propaganda, any other kind of sort of like programming would be pretty much superfluous after all that. Um, another, another possibility is that this whole zombie stuff is actually a it's a big sort of distraction, it's a deviation. It's designed to launder some other kind of secret operation that's going on. Now, this is a very popular idea in ufology. I mean, you've had a lot of speakers who talk about UFOs. I myself mentioned them in my last speech here. Um, and the question is, 
If you, if you study UFO magazines and books, sooner or later you're going to come across this idea. The idea that the government is actually creating the whole UFO um, phenomenon as a kind of artificially induced myth. The reason is, is because when they think that people's interest in UFOs is actually helping to protect and keep secret other much more down-to-earth government operations such as secret uh, aviation technology and things like that. And they say, well, people go to Area 51 looking for UFOs. That's good. They're not looking for the new spy planes there. Um, there's some books been written about this. There's, some, there's a film made about on this very, very subject by people who are interested in UFOs. The problem is that's actually... I wonder if that kind of thing is practical, because it's a very, very risky gambit if you're going to draw somebody's attention towards something with the, intention, with the ultimate intent of deflecting it away. It's the kind of plan that could backfire in many, many ways. And the people, if it is a hoax, and the people perpetrating the hoax have to be very, very confident they actually can fool people. It's rather like a spy operating undercover. If, if, you, if, you, if you're a spy in any country and you don't, you, you don't want to blend in, you, you do want to blend in, you don't want to, you don't want to be caught. You could, dress, you could walk down the street dressed as a clown. Okay, you wouldn't look like an enemy spy if you did that, but you would still look like a clown. You would still get you, people would still draw their attention towards you. It's not a very good idea. So this is why I find that whole thing very, very far fetched indeed. Um, so I was mulling over these stories, and then uh, it got more complicated. Another new story came my way. It's actually audio. Here we go. And now to a shocking story out of Harford County, a case of cannibalism. Police say the remains, part of the remains discovered earlier this week, were actually eaten. 11 News reporter Rob Roblin has the gruesome details. He joins us live at the sheriff's office in Harford County. Rob. Well, it started out as a missing persons report, but it ended up as murder. Police here in Harford County say this is a crime of murder and cannibalism. Police say this man, 21-year-old Alexander Kenyu, not only killed his roommate with a knife, but he also ate the victim's heart and part of his brains. He stated that he consumed Mr. Cody's internal organs, specifically his heart and portions of his brain. The suspect then led detectives to a dumpster at 536 Trimble Road in Joppa, where they recovered what remained of Mr. Cody's body. This investigation started as a missing person report that the deceased, 37-year-old Cujo Bonsafo A.G. Cody, had gone jogging and never came home. Last night, when police searched the victim and suspect's home, they found body parts of the victim. Specifically, a human head and two human hands and two tins. Police say at this time they have no motive. We have a lot of follow-up to do, uh, and some of that follow-up will be uh, re-interviewing uh, the suspect and at this point I can't tell you one way or the other. Is he saying why at all? He is not. And this investigation is ongoing. The suspect is in jail. He has been denied bail. Reporting live, Rob Robin, WBAL-TV 11 News. I told you it was disturbing, didn't I? Um, now that's an odd freak crime you might think, but then the very next day, this happened. Right now, new at 11 for you, new information on that horrific attack by the MacArthur Causeway. Police were forced to open fire on a naked man who refused to stop chewing the face off of another man. We look into what could have caused this attack, and we have new details on just how much of the victim's face was literally bitten off. CBS 4's Tiffany Helberg spoke to a police officer who was at the crime scene. She joins us live from Miami. And Tiffany, the officer believes the man clearly, clearly was on some very, very powerful drugs. That's right, Cynthia. The Paternal Order of Police president tells me this crop of LSD is a major threat to police officers as well as the rest of us. He says it turns normal people into monsters that possess this superhuman strength and no ability to feel pain. He believes that's what was behind the incident that unfolded here Saturday in broad daylight just off the MacArthur Causeway exit right next to the Miami Herald. And it was the Herald's surveillance video that caught much of it on tape. Now, 
Now, we want to warn you, much of the details you're about to hear are disturbing and gruesome. It totally horrified me. Uh, this was probably my 30 years as a police officer, uh, the nastiest, most horrific uh, incident I've ever seen. An incident partially caught on camera by Miami Herald surveillance. Fraternal Order of Police President Armando Aguilar says that cop had no choice but to shoot when he found a naked man chewing away at another man's face. Had had his face completely eaten uh, from the top of his forehead to uh, almost his jaw. Uh, it, it wasn't just that he was being bit, it's that the person was actually swallowing pieces of his face. His cannibalistic attacker unfazed by the officer's commands to stop. When the police approached him, he turned around and growled and kept attacking the, uh, the victim on the floor. That's when he says the officer shot him. The initial shots uh, had no effect. He had to repeatedly shoot him about four times until the man collapsed. The naked attacker now dead on the sidewalk. There he is on the left. His now faceless victim lay on the ground next to him, likely writhing in pain as sources say he no longer had eyes or a nose. Well, I can only imagine by talking to the officer, uh, I see that he's totally traumatized. It was like something out of a horror movie. Aguilar says this is the worst out of about four similar cases in Dade County to happen recently. In other incidents, the people have admitted to taking a new strain of what they're calling bad LSD. Their body temperature reaches such a uh, high degree that they have to take all their clothes off because they're basically melting from the inside. He says that was a case just blocks away on Bayshore Drive. That was in March when a bloody naked man who had been hit by a cab growled at police and showed superhuman strength when they tried to help him. There was more than 10 or 15 officers on the scene and even after they tasered the man two or three times, he was still able to take a baton away from one of our officers and uh, severely damage her arm. Scary stuff. Now, I'm told that man from the March incident did survive. As for the man related to this incident off the MacArthur Causeway who was attacked in the face, we know he is currently hospitalized in critical condition. Live in downtown Miami, Tiffany Helberg, CBS 4 News Tonight. Unbelievable to hear it all. Thanks for that, Tiffany. Sorry, sorry, anyone found it disturbing. Um, I find it disturbing too. I think we need to know about this as this is going on, especially since there are suspicious elements. In this case, um, the first attack, you, the first news story you heard about was took place in Harford County, Maryland, USA. I want you to remember that. It's very important, as you'll find out later. Um, and basically, the, the attacker was um, had taken something called bath salts, which is now quite a widespread designer drug. Um, there's several, been several instances with bath salts, and another one I'm going to tell you about in a moment. What's amazing is the resilience of this guy. The policeman had to shoot him four times. And um, which is really quite unremarkable when you think about it. This guy seems to be impervious to pain. His body seems to be supercharged. Now this is um, another man, Rabbi Louis Suarez. This guy has been uh, apprehended for using his teeth inappropriately in a public place. In this case, he was walking down the beach at Magaluf, which is uh, on the island of Mallorca, where uh, lots of people go on holidays. Um, he was basically walking down the bridge, biting everybody he could find. And the police, it took about 10 police and paramedics to, to, to subdue him. And there's a video actually of this guy, and he is roaring like a trapped animal. He seems to have lost his humanity. Um, there was another incident in San Antonio on Ibiza, where something, something just like this happened. And um, there's talk about a new drug called Cannibal, which is like bath salts. Very appropriate name, Cannibal. Um, of course, the Balearic Islands, which is where this, these things have been happening, they're very well known for holidays in the sun, especially for young singles who want to make merry. And of course, that will involve drugs. But there's more and more of these drugs which have this effect on people coming out. Um, there's one from Russia called crocodile, which means crocodile, which has a similar effect on people's minds. It also makes your skin bro break down into scaly lesions, which is why it's called crocodile. And then it goes on. The BBC are planning a new, new program. They're in quick production of this. I survived the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, um, I want to thank Heidi, actually, my friend Heidi, who sent me this. Um, yeah, this is, it's very interesting because if you go to the BBC 3's, 3's website, you can find it under works in progress kind of things. They're appealing for, they use the word contestants. I don't know if that's the right word to use, but they want people to come forward and take part. 
And what's interesting is actually, it's, it's maybe just a coincidence, but it's, uh, it's actually listed on the BBC website above another, another uh, TV programme they're planning, which has the working title of All You Can Eat. <laughs> so I wonder if that's a coincidence. But anyway, the BBC say, have you ever wondered what it would be like to be hunted down by the walking dead? If an apocalypse struck, this could happen to you, male or female, old or young. Would you have the creativity, mental ability and survival skills to pass the ultimate test? A brand new BBC Dream Reality TV series is looking for contestants. So whether you're a zombie fanatic, you love the thrill of being scared, or just think you'll look good being chased by zombies, we want to hear from you. Whatever your reason, we want to know why you'd like to take part. What personal attributes you would use to survive and why we should pick you? I Survive the Zombie Public. Pockets is produced for Leaves by Tiger Aspect, which is a, a commissioned TV company. Um, it sounds like it's inspired probably by Darren Brown's Apocalypse. But once again, we see this zombie trope being emerged in the popular culture. It's becoming very commercial. I mean, the CDC has actually, um, Ali Khan and those people, they've actually, you can actually buy merchandise. You can get, you can get these preparing to buy one baseball caps and beer mats. And, Things like that, even coffee mugs. I mean, that would make it popular in the office, wouldn't it? It's like it's like it's become almost a kind of um, it's almost it's almost like a kind of um, sh it is it's a uh, what's the word sh retail it's a retail craze, if you know what I mean. So so what what's going on? I mean, it's, it could be like say some kind of psychological operation. Or it could be, I mean, it may be you, another way of encoding or disguising something else, not in the way of as I was describing earlier, like the UFOs, where they're covering their just basically putting in something really strange to cover something normal. No, it's not like that. But it could be symbolic of something else. It could be symbolic of, in the same way that a lot of the Cold, a lot of drama series and a lot of fiction in the Cold War contained a lot of very obvious propaganda. There was like, um, in the early Cold War, there were TV programs like Invaders. Because you, you can get them on YouTube about these aliens that want to come down and take over the world. It's pretty obvious. It's symbolic of the communists. It's symbolic of the, of the Soviet Union and the Cold War. Uh, the, it's, it's, so, it's actually quite, it's quite um, sort of like naive, kind of, maybe it's because it's America, maybe because it's long ago. I think we're more streetwise nowadays. And certainly in this country, we're more streetwise. But it is, to me, it's very, very transparent rhetoric they're using. I mean, UFOs, they might as well have had Amazon sickles on them. It's that obvious. The question is, there are no big bad communists in the world nowadays. So, what are the, what are the zombies, if this is what zombies are, what are they meant to symbolise? What, what, what are they a metaphor for? What, what, what real phenomena are the zombies being made into an allegory for? It could be terrorists, Muslims, immigrants, unemployed people, the homeless people. I mean, it's, it, it, could, it could be used to symbolise some kind of underclass or some kind of undesirable that we all need to gang together to fight against and we need more, we need, we need, we need, we need to agree to government reforms in order to fight these, these un, evil underclass. It could be something like that. So it's societal and cultural programming, possibly. Um, but I don't accept that as certain, all right? There may be much more going on. It could be symbolic of, despite what I was saying about the, uh, before about the, the fact they've already got a lot of plans in place, it could still be symbolic of pandemics. They use the phrase pandemic or zombie apocalypse because zombies have a lot in common with viruses. This is very interesting because apart from, well, apart from George Romero today, all, almost all the zombies are sci-fi zombies. They have, they're created by something that is scientifically explicable. It's a disease, it's a, it's a virus, it's a contagion of some kind. And of course, the zombies themselves are, are a kind of virus because how they reproduce. They reproduce like a virus reproduces. We'll, we'll have a break in a moment. I was going to say that zombies have a lot in common with viruses and since they don't, they don't reproduce sexually like, like animals do and, and most plants do. They, they reproduce like a virus. So viruses don't reproduce sexually. Viruses actually have to, they can only reproduce by invading the host of an, a, another cell and using that cell to make a copy of itself. 
Zombies can only reproduce that way too. They reproduce by biting somebody, so that, that person becomes a zombie. So, there's a, so that's why I think that's possibly what we're talking about here. But um, now's as good a time as any. I'll see you in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. Oh my God. I hope you enjoyed your break there and have a nice cup of tea. Now, where were we? Yeah, we, um, we've, we're in a situation where there's these zombies in the media, there's seen, there are zombies in publications, there's in government, official government documentation. Um, so they've gone, they're, they're not just in fiction, they're in fact as well. And this is, this is, what's, this is what's concerning me. So, the idea is, what does it mean? Um, this is the question. Um, so, um, we should continue with the... We'll carry on with this. Now, uh, this is... We're going to get onto the idea that, of disease, about... Uh, we're going to continue talking about uh, whether there is, theoretically, some kind of known pathogen that could cause people to become zombies. Now, this is... Um, an article published on the 27th of October 2010, just a few months before those other documents were published, is by Kurt Thann of National Geographic News, and it says, <clears throat> In the zombie flicks, 28 days later, and I am legend, an unstoppable viral plague sweeps across humanity, transforming people into mindless monsters with cannibalistic tendencies. Though dead humans can't come back to life, certain viruses can induce such aggressive zombie-like behaviour, scientists say. For instance, rabies, a viral disease that infects the central nervous system, can drive people to be violently mad, according to Dr. Samita Andriansky, a virologist at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine. Combine rabies with the ability of a flu virus to spread quickly through the air, and you might have the makings of a zombie apocalypse. This is basically what happened in um, 28 Days Later. Um, is a rabies virus mutation possible? Now, unlike movie zombies, which become reanimated almost immediately after infection, the first signs that a human has rabies, like anxiety, confusion, hallucinations, and paralysis, don't appear for 10 days or so later, as the virus incubates inside the body. Once rabies sets in, though, it's fatal within a week if it's left untreated. If the genetic roots of rabies experience enough changes or mutations in its incubation time, this could be reduced dramatically. Many viruses have naturally high mutation rates and constantly change as a means of evading or bypassing the defences of their hosts. There are various ways viral mutations can occur, for example, through copying mistakes during gene replication or exposure to ultraviolet light. If a rabies virus can mutate fast enough, it could cause infection within an hour or a few hours. That's entirely possible, as the entity said. So would airborne rabies create the rage virus? But for, but for the rabies virus to trigger a zombie pandemic, like in the movies, it would have to be much more contagious. Humans typically, ca typically catch rabies after being bitten by an infected animal, animal like a dog, and the infection just stops there. Thanks to pet vaccinations, people very rarely contract rabies and even fewer people die from the disease. For example, in 2008, only two cases of human rabies infection were reported by the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and no deaths. A faster mode of transport would be through the air. All rabies has to do to go airborne is to borrow traits from a virus like influenza. Different forms or strains of the same virus can swap pieces of genetic code through a process called reassortment or recombination. But unrelated viruses simply do not hybridize in nature. Likewise, it's scientifically unheard of for two radically different viruses, such as rabies and influenza, to borrow traits. They're too different. They cannot share genetic information. Viruses assemble only parts that belong to them, and they don't mix and match from different families. Is an engineered zombie virus possible? That's the key question. Andriansky says, it's theoretically possible, though extremely difficult, to create a hybrid rabies influenza virus using modern genetic engineering techniques. Sure, I could imagine a scenario where you mix rabies and flu together to get airborne transmission. 
a measles virus to get personality changes, the encephalitis virus to infect your brain with fever, and thus increase ingre- aggression even further, and then throw in the Ebola virus to cause internal bleeding. Combine all these things and you get something like a zombie virus, but nature doesn't allow these things to happen. You'd most likely just get a dead virus. But nature's not behind every virus. And uh, I wanted to show you this as well, because this is almost, this came out much more recently. This, this is still going on. This is the US Department of Defense, which has released a document, or it's, it's not released, it's actually in the public domain, it's not classified. Um, but it's, it's, it's a really, really strange um, thing because it's got a catchy title, um, CD Rust RUS Stratcom Complan 888-11. Zombie, um, counter zombie dominance operations U. Oh, but this, this one though is dated the 30th of April 2011. This is a new story that came out recently, but the, the actual document is around about that same time period we're talking about spring and summer 2011. So this is just like the CDC, just like the Bristol City Council. Um, now there's a disclaimer in the opening which states that the reason such a completely impossible scenario was chosen was in case the general public saw a more feasible fictional training plan and thought that this was real. But as you'll see, it doesn't quite make sense because um, the scenarios are so outrageous. They're so detailed. That there's detail along with the outrageous nature. Uh, what, they, what they've done is that they, um, the US Department of Defense may be committing a double bluff here. And I think it's the, the others might be, it, it may be a kind of double bluff as well. Um, that's far more effective in a way than classifying the document because um, you, can, you can sort of like, it, it's, it's more likely people will sort of like get confused. Um, now, it, it could be also that, again, it's in code. It could be that the, whoever's behind this document has um, arranged it so that there are people, even though this is an unclassified document, there are people who are initiated into higher levels of knowledge who understand there is some kind of symbolism behind this, it's allegorical or something. But it makes you wonder why, what exactly that could be, because it says, um, the stated purpose of the plan is to preserve non-zombie human lives to establish a vigilant defense condition, defensive condition aimed at protecting human lives from zombies. There will be established a hierarchy of zombie conditions, shortened to zombie cons or Z-cons, basically so that the, the troops can operate under a series of standing orders, so they can, they can operate more effectively. So they, they'll just set zombie condition one, two, three, four, and all the personnel will already have a set of standing orders on how to, to actually um, to actually go ahead. Um, these are all predetermined standing orders. Now, they, there is another purpose here. It says, if necessary, there are plans to conduct military operations to eradicate zombie threats to human safety, according to the instructions of the President or the Secretary of Defense. Also, to aid civil authorities in maintaining law and order and preserve public structure and, in, and public services and infrastructure, that word again keeps coming up, during a zombie pandemic and its aftermath. Now, this is a really weird bit. The document also ca- characterizes different kinds of zombies. Um, I don't want to make of this, it's really strange. There are pathogenic zombies created by a disease of some kind. Radiation zombies, these are people who become zombies when exposed to electromagnetic or particle radiation. There are little three letter code words actually for, for all these little acronyms for all these different types of zombies. There are um, evil magic zombies. These are ones of the more traditional kind, basically they're conjured up by um, black magicians by um, or occult supernatural means. Space zombies, which are aliens that look like zombies. Um, now, all of the above, all, they all exist in, in science fiction and in horror fiction at the moment. But this is, but this, this is where it's really weird, because this pamphlet branches out into a completely original area, because it says there are, unbelievably, there are vegetarian zombies. <laughs> now, these pose no direct threat, threat to human life. The idea is that vegetarian zombies might harm society because they'll eat farm produce, like a plague of locusts. And... Um, <laughs> 
you share chicken zombies. Chicken, chicken zombies are basically vulnerable on poultry that have been gassed. And, um, they, uh, and they come and they get reanimated afterwards. Now, there's, the document actually goes into a lot of detail. This is what's really <coughs> creepy about it. There's, um, there's, some legal doc there's some legal paragraphs in it which deal with the implications of killing zombies because the law must officially denote them as non-human before a military operation can take place against them. Another, if you watch the film Night of the Living Dead, one of the characters is actually shot by one of the others because he thinks he's a zombie and mistakes this guy for a zombie. Um, what's, what's, this, this contains lots of elaborate details, there's lots of footnotes about a theorised zombie pandemic situation. And it's really, what's, what's strange is if this is not real, it's not really zombies or it's just a code or it's just some kind of joke or anything like that, it's very, very hard to see how how any of these contingencies could be adapted to another eventuality. I mean, these are specific skills and specific sort of like um, training and orders and things like that, which it's hard to see how they could be applied generally. So if it's symbolic for maybe, I don't know, Mexico invading or something like that, you'd have it, you'd be a lot more vague. And you'd be able to fit it, you'd be able to change the sort of terminology of the scenarios and fit them in. But you can't do that with this. So I don't think this, it doesn't sound like this is just some kind of camouflage. Um, I mean, it's really, really hard to know what's going on here. It's, it's, it's slightly tongue in cheek, but it's still serious. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's an element of seriousness to this nature. Um, Now, uh, we were talking about this, someone's read this book in the audience, yeah, um, and uh, this is Lab 257 by Michael Christopher Carroll. It's a book about Plum Island. Now, Plum Island is at the National Animal Disease Centre, uh, run by the US Department of Agriculture, and it was also part of the Cold War bio-warfare programme. Um, I think it's been, it's, there's, a fictional, there's a fictional story called Plum Island, I think it's Michael Crichton or something like that. Um, but this is, this, is, this is a very, very serious matter because it's a secret laboratory on an island where research is done into animal disease. Now, um, what Michael Carroll is suggesting in his book is this, this is chronic Lyme disease was created in this laboratory. And we're going to talk a little bit more about other diseases which I think have come out of the, out of the bio warfare program, which I'm going to describe in detail. Plum Island has, a, it has this very, very dark reputation. I mean, there's, a, there's this Montauk monster. I mean, Montauk itself, which is nearby, the nearest land is a place called Montauk, Long Island, New York, which is where there's this alleged to be a, a secret government facility too, which does all kinds of things, which I can't go into now. Um, a strange creature was washed up on the seashore. It's supposed to be a raccoon. Um, it could be, but based on what we know about what's going on, it's, you've got to ask the question about whether something else is happening. There's very, the accountability of these facilities is, is not in the democratic domain. It's, it, there's, there's no congressional oversight or presidential oversight. It's very, very, there's, there's, it, there's different levels of classification as well. I've got to read the book, actually. That's, that's on my list. I've not read it yet. But um, what's interesting is that the Plum Island has actually been closed and it's, um, it's been moved. Basically, all, all the facilities within it are being moved to another place. Now, Having it, the reason it was built on an island is because of it, it dealt with disease. It was a disease research laboratory, which means that if there's any, any sort of outbreak, it won't go very far. It's a small island. Um, there's no way that any sense, for instance, an animal escaped from a laboratory, a diseased animal with some kind of new mutated virus. It wouldn't be able to get very far because it couldn't, because it's on this island. But this whole facility and a new, a brand new facility has been built in Manhattan, Kansas. Now, if you get your atlas out and look at a map of the United States, it's in the geographical center of the continent of the United States. Anything that escapes from there is in the perfect pos position to spread in all directions. It's, in, it's, it's being built right now, actually. It's going to be called the, um, the National Biological and Agricultural Defense Facility. It's going to open in a couple of years, and it's run by the not by the uh, Department of Agriculture, by the, but by the Department of Homeland Security. And it's, I think most people who study viruses admit that the most likely cause of an emergent disease in the human population is one from animals infected to man. 
And if, an, if a diseased animal escaped from there, it could infect God knows how many people. I mean, the, the question is, if that happens, is it accidental or on purpose? And are we dealing with, and is, is perhaps some of the viruses they, they're developing there, things that part can cause zombie-like symptoms in humans? This is a film, I cannot recommend this film enough. I've got a DVD, DVD copy over here. Um, this is In Light and Trust, the CIA, Hollywood, and Bioterrorism by Dr. Leonard Horowitz. And uh, it is a, um, it is a three hour long documentary which exposes the history of the biological warfare program and the truth behind a lot of the lies which are coming out. Um, basically this guy, Len Horowitz, he's a public health expert who was blacklisted because of his views. He was a dentist, he was a, a public health official, and he made this film in response to a, a program that was actually put on the, uh, the actual DHHS, um, which runs the, the CDC. Which, which the Pandemic 101 thing came out of, the zombies. It has a TV channel, yeah, and it, had a, it produces a lot of propaganda programs. Um, one of them, which was all about a history, um, yeah, a history of bioterrorism. And it was a very, very nice, cuddly amusement. Talked about how bad the Japanese were, the Soviets and the Nazis, and America was wonderful and they didn't do anything wrong, it was just, it just, the only reason to develop these biological weapons was because it would scare the enemy word, etc, etc. Now, um, Horowitz basically reviews this program and takes it to pieces. And um, what he says is that, um, that the biological warfare program actually is far more extensive than the official records say. And it's also linked into the so-called War on Cancer, which is the sort of big research program that was launched in, in the beginning of the 1970s, but which... Um, which is linked to basically this biological warfare program. And um, it, it talks about the need for depopulation. That is the fact, some people think there are too many people in the world and there need to be fewer. And there are some people going to very, very desperate steps now to try and make fewer people in the world. In, in other words, killing people. Genocide, that means killing certain types of people, all the words are taking in culture. And eugenics. Eugenics is effectively genetically modified modifying and selectively breeding humanity. Now, um, the book, the uh, film talks about a, a book that was published in 1967 called Re Report from Iron Mountain, which is alleged to be the leaked minutes of a secret meeting that took place in 1963. There's no such place as Iron Mountain, so this is obviously code for something else. But there was a highly secret meeting. Um, in, a few years later, in 1970, a guy called Leonard Lewin came forward and put his hand up and said, Oh, it's all right. I wrote it. It's just a joke. Well, I, maybe someone said, Len, just, here's 50 grand. Just tell him you wrote that book with you. Because that very same year, um, a book called um, Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. Now, I know Ian R. Crane was here a few weeks ago, and he mentioned this. Uh, that came out in 1970, that same year that uh, Lewin spouted out this trying to, trying to debunk report from Iron Mountain. Um, what it turned out is that the, the, the latter book was written by Zbigniew Brzezinski, who's still a major figure in the American world of statesmanship. <laughs> but it contains a lot of the same information. I can't help wondering if Brzezinski was at this Iron Mountain meeting. So what does it say? Well, the, um, the report from Iron Mountain talks about how war is necessary for the survival of social systems in the world. And that even if lasting peace could be achieved, it would almost certainly not be in the best interests of society to achieve it. The government, as we know it, could not exist without war. War, it said, also served as a vital function for diverting collective community aggression. And so what they said was that they recommended that um, new scenarios be created deliberately to emulate the economic and social functions of war. Now this is, sounds very similar to what George Orwell wrote in 1984. Have you all read 1984 by George Orwell? Yeah, it's an amazing book, written, in, written uh, published in 1949, talks about us, a, a new world order of the future, complete government totalitarian control. 
And one of the lines in that film, in, in that book, I remember, was, war is not designed to be won or lost, war is designed to be continuous. And it says here, a viable polit political substitute for war must posit a generalized external menace to each society or a nature and degree sufficient to require the organization and acceptance of political authority. And that's a long-winded way of saying that um, they need to find ways to control people without the fear of large-scale wars. So we're talking about substitutes for war. Now, uh, biological warfare has a long history. Um, this is a biological lab. The scientists working there actually have biological protection suits to stop them being infected by what they're dealing with. It's in the, even in the Middle Ages, they, during the Crusades, they would toss um, the bodies of plague victims during a siege into a fortress with a catapult to try and spread the disease in the, in the fortress sources, make people panic and hopefully try and run out through the gates, which means the gates will be open and they can get in. Uh, but really, it's really took off in the 20th century. And people, people say it had its origins with the Nazis. That's, that's not true. It was actually a joint venture between the Nazis and the Rockefeller Foundation. The Nazis, the Nazis often get blamed for everything, but actually when you look into the facts of it, everything the Nazis did, the Americans did too, and the British, and everyone else, and the Soviets, and they were at least as bad as the Nazis, sometimes worse. They worked alongside the Nazis. In fact, the, the first eugenics conference was not held in Nazi Germany, it was held in the United States in 1934, and the Rockefeller Foundation invited prominent Nazis over to attend it. Um, in 1945, we had Operation Paperclip, which actually brought a lot of the Nazi scientists over to the, to the West, including, of course, Werner von Braun, the rocket scientist, but also many others, including a lot of these biowarfare technicians and scientists. Um, you ever wondered why the names of pharmaceutical companies often sound very German? Have you noticed that? Pfizer, Bayer, Roche, Merck. I wonder if there's a connection there. There's definitely a German feel to them. And um, in 1941, the United States Biological Warfare Program set up camp in Fort Detrick, which is in Harford County, Maryland. This is when I find out if all you guys have been paying attention. What happened, what happened in Harford County, Maryland as well? That was where like, one of the cannibal attacks happened in 2012. I wonder if there's a connection. Now, um, in that same year, that very, very same year, 1970, seems to be a crucial year in, in this uh, history of this. There was a document published by the American War College called A Revolution in Military Affairs. And it talks about a shift, a shift from the entire concept, the entire strategy of war would move from the traditional types, which was big gun battlefield warfare, nuclear weapons, simple biological chemical weapons, and it would transform it into a completely new form of warfare, sophisticated biological warfare, Cancer viruses, and we know, that cancer, we know that some cancers are caused by viruses, and these people wanted to actually create them as biological weapons, so-called non-lethal weapons, quote-unquote, things like the taser, which is supposedly non-lethal, even though it's killed several dozen people since its invention, and also um, electromagnetic weapons and psychological warfare. And this, this document was quite openly said what we are proposing is contrary to American values and will be necessary to use the media to, to acclimatize unconditioned individuals. Unconditioned individuals means people like us, people who will tell them to stuff it. That's what it all means. So they're basically saying they know that we will not we will consider what they're doing immoral, and if we find out, we need to be dealt with through brainwashing in the media. Now, the reason they wanted to, one of the reasons they wanted to uh, Transport had this revolution in military affairs was plausible deniability. These cancer viruses would be untraceable. There'd also be a long delay between infection and um, pathology, in other words, a long incubation period, sometimes years. Which means that you could actually, if you wanted to, you could wage war on an enemy and defeat them without, them, without any official declaration of war. You could engage them. Complete, complete secrecy. They would be destroyed, and there'd be no one could ever point the finger at you. There's no way you'd ever be able to prove that that, that that disease came from you if you're careful about what you did. They'd never know what hit them. They'd never know who hit them. 
But the question is, who is the enemy that who is the enemy they're talking about? Well, I think the enemy they're talking about is all of us. It's not only one particular country, it's the people of the world. And um, the United States is not alone. The, the USSR had its own biological warfare program, the Cold War, and so to our discredit in the United Kingdom. It went back much earlier, actually. The UK's biowarfare program is one of the oldest. This here is a photograph taken in 1942 on Grunyard Island, which is just off the coast of Scotland in the remote um, western, western Highlands, not far from Motherpool. Yeah, it's, um, what they did was, this was, a, you can see these two guys here wearing fire warfare protection suits, carrying dead sheep. They used this little island to test anthrax as a possible biological warfare weapon to use on Germany, this was in World War II. They, took, they used it, they used sheep as the test subject. They basically infected the island with anthrax and just watched how quickly the sheep died how quickly the sheep could some of the sheep could pass the disease onto other sheep, and uh, things like that. So, uh, ironically, this, this uh, ironically this, this project was called Operation Vegetarian, <laughs> and uh, it had a very long-lasting effect because because Grunion Island was actually nicknamed Anthrax Island, and it was completely off limits and it was only decontaminated in 1990. That's because the sheep are vegetarian. Mm, they do. Uh, now, this is now one of the things that um, the report from Iron Mountain talks about. It's, it's really sinister. This is why I say that there's no point, there's no point America um, trying to claim any moral high ground over the Nazis. Because the report, I mean, the report from Iron Mountain, you see, it's, it's not, uh, the reason I think the report from Iron Mountain is true is because everything that's suggested has been tried out and is being tried out now or was tried out. Um, now one of those things is the Tuskegee Human Experimentation, which is the longest biological warfare um, study, the clinical study, the longest of these studies that um, has ever been done. It lasted for 40 years. Now one of the things that they talk about in terms of eugenics is preserving racial balance. And they talk about the Caucasian Negro mix, which means that they, they basically want to make sure there aren't too many black people in the world. Now the Tuskegee experiment, this is what shot from it. This, this ran from 1932 to 1972. They basically um, infected 600 black people, poor black people from, the, from rural areas of the United States, with syphilis, and they watched the disease progress without treating it. So they watched how they passed, how the disease spread within the community. Syphilis could be passed through touching, through sexual contact, through um, shared, you know, it could be part, it's, it's highly contagious. These guys were told they were getting free health care. They weren't even informed about the, they weren't even given for, they weren't, didn't even give informed consent as to what was actually um, being done to them. And then by the end of it, the, of all these 600 people, by the end of it, only 74 still left alive. And many more died even since then. That's the kind of people you're dealing with here. They're not human. I'm telling you. Maybe David Ike is right and they're reptilians. I don't discount that for a moment. I take it seriously. 98 million Americans were given a polio vaccine contaminated with cancer-causing viruses, a mix of CDC. That's right. This, this, this was incredible when you think about how long it went on. The, a virus called SV40, which is a virus that we can found in chimpanzees, which is known to cause cancer in many different species, including the chimpanzees, um, somehow this found its way into the polio vaccine that was administered between 1955 and 1961, right across the United States. Um, how, it, how that, it's a big question, I mean, how did no one spot it? How did it get in there in the first place? And how was it allowed, to, how was that allowed for so long? We don't know, I mean, these people, we don't know how many cancers. No. It was spotted, one of the doctors, he was a whistleblower on that, was told to show it. Yeah, well, so the first one of the guys was told to shut up about it. Yeah, I mean, we don't know how many people who have these injections, these are baby boomers. They're now elderly. How many of them died of cancers caused by this? And um, there's all sorts of other diseases coming out. It's not just, it's not just cancer, there's things like Lyme disease. There's these various things like um, ME, ALS, they have these little sibilant little acronyms. They're not even proper words. And some doctors don't deny they exist. But they, they're real, people suffer from them. Allergies, I mean, so many allergies now coming out. I mean, what's, it seems like all kinds of diseases that were, I mean, were unheard of a little while ago now seem to be commonplace. Or new diseases, I mean, leukemia. I mean, 100 years ago, if a child caught leukemia, it was, it was, um, 
They were a test case. They were, it was a medical curiosity. Now, hundreds of kids get it every day. Now, this here is Richard M. Nixon, who is um, the most deceitful president of the United States in modern history. And that's quite an achievement, isn't it, when you think about the competition he's up against. Now, he, he officially announced in 1969 that the US prior warfare program was ending. But you know what? I'm sorry to tell you this. He actually lied. He told, he told a fib. He uttered an untruth. What happened was he, he used a legal loophole. He changed the formation of the prior warfare program from offenses, offensive to defensive, which in, in, in biological warfare terms makes no difference at all. And reopened the next step the following year, 1970, the year that Mr. Kudzinski published his book, and the Revolution in Military Affairs document was published. And guess what? His budget was increased from 21.9 million to 23.2 million dollars a year. So he didn't only continue the biological warfare program, he escalated it. And this is in line with the Revolution in Military Affairs document because um, in, Fort, in Fort Detrick, they went on to produce these various um, kinds of viruses. Some of it's classified, which included, this is the, this is the really sinister bit, um, because we're talking about cancer, but we're also talking about viruses that cause immunodeficiency. Now, um, this is where we come on to another aspect of this. This is a guy called Dr. Robert Gallo, who's a Nobel Prize laureate. Um, he worked for a company called Litton Industries, a, a, a actual, it was actually a subsidiary called Litton Bionetics, which was a major contractor to the US biological warfare program, including various pharmaceutical companies. This is an infernal triangle we're talking about between the state, the corporate, and the military that produces these demonic substances, which I think have been used to wage war on us. Um, one of the things that Gallo did was he developed, he developed a new hepatitis B vaccine, which he tested on a group of people in Africa in, in the 70s, and um, male homosexuals from California. And um, what happened was, a few years later, those particular groups of people started developing a new strange disease that had never been seen before. A disease which caused, it seemed to deplete the immune system, it caused strange cancers and infections to take hold of their bodies, which really the immune system, a healthy immune system, should be able to fight off. Um, Robert Gallo um, investigated this and he discovered it was caused by a virus which he named and he was credited for discovering it was the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. The disease which these men caught and other people caught was called the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS. We don't know how many people have died of AIDS since then. We know it's in numbers in the millions. That's, But um, it all tra can be traced back to this guy and his hepatitis vaccine that he tested. So the, the official story of AIDS is it came from it was accidentally transmitted to humans from a monkey bite. It's nonsense. And there's an interview on this film. Please, it's on YouTube. You don't need to buy the DVD. Um, there's an interview with, with this guy. It's, it's, it was actually originally a secret interview, but Horowitz has managed to get hold of it. With a guy, he's actually not 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 Gallo, but so some one of his colleagues is saying that talks about how the HIV virus got in, actually was created and how it got into vaccines. Now, um, so we're saying here basically disease is a weapon. It's a weapon that can be waged in war against other countries or by the elite against all of us. It is produced in various institutions like Fort Detrick, and interestingly, the National Cancer Institute, in 1970, the very, very same year that the biowarfare defensive program opened, moved into Fort Detrick. So the National Cancer Institute and the US Biological Warfare Program were actually sharing offices. And you couldn't make it just so blatant, it's so obvious. We've had other things coming out as well. We've got like mad cow disease, BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy which is caused by a prion, which is a, a new type of infectious agent, which is very deadly. It can't even be destroyed by fire. And it's got its human form is called creutzfeldt jakob disease. And they, the government now admitted that several people have been, a number of people have been infected by, have suffered from creutzfeldt jakob disease because they caught BSE off cows. This can jump through species. So where does this tie into the zombie subject? 
We'll soon see. Now, it's important, one thing it's important to realise is that there may be people involved in this agenda that I'm talking about this evening who may not necessarily be evil, they may not necessarily be malicious people. Because this is what this is one of the things the skeptics will always say to you. They'll say, well, how how could they could anyone do this? Why would anyone be recruited into such a demonic program? I think some of them might be in it because they think it's the only way to save the world. Because during the last few years, you, you can't have escaped anyone's notice that the, the Earth's environment and concerns over it has become one of the biggest causes for um, worry and fear among the people of the world. And that actually can be traced back to a report from Iron Mountain because that book actually says that environmental damage and the need to tackle environmental damage could be one of these substitutes for war that they, always, they want really, really badly. Now, um, I mean, you can't switch on the news without hearing about fears of disasters. There's global warming, climate change, peak oil, the destruction of natural habitats, biodiversity. That's another buzzword, along with infrastructure. Biodiversity, you hear that all the time, don't you? Never heard it a few years ago, but now it's, it's on the lips of every user of that. Soil erosion, water shortages, water shortages, etc., etc. Ozone layer depletion. Um, and the, the drive to find solutions to these problems, or perceived problems, because I'm going to talk to you a bit more about, about whether these are real issues or fake. But whether they are or not, the drive to find solutions to them is intensely political. It's extremely political indeed. Ah, now this here is, of course, Bill Gates with his um, syringe there, loaded with cancer viruses. Oh, sorry, I meant vaccines to protect people from disease. And this is, this is Bill Gates' infamous equation. Carbon dioxide, CO2, um, equals, this is an equation, P people times service thanks, services provide energy per service and CO2 per unit of energy. Um, so basically what he's, he's actually said this in his talk. He was surprisingly candid in one of these talks he gave. I think he must, maybe he was drinking or something, he forgot. He, there's certain things you're not supposed to mention in public. And he says, one or more of these factors has to be reduced. In other words, maybe people are one of those factors. And he actually said in his talk, he, he actually let it slip that the vax, he, he said well, he, he's keen to see a population reduction and vaccines were a part of that. And funny enough, it just seemed to go over everyone's head, but then maybe it was edited afterwards, I don't know, maybe the audience was different. It was a TED talk and they're very carefully controlled. So there's talk about now about reducing the world's population and um, this was in the report from Iron Mountain. And there's people, people got together and they've said that the, the number of people this world can support using with current modern lifestyles is less is 500 million. That's less than 10% of the people in the world today. That's what these experts are saying. Now, this, this drive for population reduction, it has an acceptable public face. There's a, there's a very, very cuddly sounding organisation called Population Matters. And its president is David Attenborough. You know, that lovely, man, that lovely sweet man who goes into the jungle and plays with gorillas. He's, he says things like, um, please have less children, everybody. And um, let's educate people. Let's teach women about contraception and things like that. But, there's this, under, there's this subtext which talks about the, of urgency. There's this subtext of desperation, as if too little, too late kind of thing. You know, and you, you can sense it, you're not in what they're saying and what they're not saying. And this is a stark departure because there's a new breed of eco warrior in this world. And it's not, these, it's not the ones you might have seen before, these well meaning people with glasses and beards who used to put on life jackets and sail rubber dinghies in the park of whaling ships. You don't get that anymore. Today's eco-warriors are, are rich power brokers. They're businessmen, they're academics, they're politicians. They wear suits and ties. They sit in secret boardrooms. And they plot. They plot against, well, God knows what they're plotting. But I, I think what they're saying in private is we can't do this while we're preserving liberal democratic piety. I think that's what they're saying. Now, this guy is Dr. Mayor Hillman. I'm not accusing him of being involved in any kind of, depop of secret depopulation agenda involving actually killing people. But he's the kind of person, when you listen to the things he says, who might be recruited 
He's the, the things he says make me think that somebody like him could be at this moment plotting the, our deaths, the deaths of all but maybe four or five people in this room. Statistically. He did a talk actually just a few weeks ago at Conway Hall where he, he talked about how deeply concerned he was by the threats of environmental damage, especially climate change. And he, 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 he spoke passionately, he, he sounded angry, he sounded misanthropic. He liked he, he, how, how evil people work, it's, 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 it's humanity's fault, and we've got to, you know, humanity doesn't deserve to live. He didn't actually say that, but he did say, he did come across, he, he sounded like, I'm this lone voice crying in the wilderness, I'm this Cassandra nobody listens to. We have these decadent masses who ignore me. And he said the politicians, governments, all they do is maintain people, people's rights to, these fundamental rights to have as many children as you want, which is not a fundamental right, according to him. To have your holidays in the sun, your gas guzzling SUVs, um, and things like that. And he says that's wrong, he says it's a terrible state of affairs. And this is what the naysayers always ask me, they say, come on Ben, how could you possibly dissuade enough people to collaborate in something so terrible as actually wanting to kill more than three quarters of people in the world? And that's a good question. I, I think at a higher level there are people who are evil and want to do it for, for a very different reason that people like Dr. Mayer have been fooled into, into, uh, into, into getting involved. I should point out right now, I, I think a lot of these, a lot of the things that these people talk about are a phony war. Some of them know it, I think Bill Gates knows it. I don't think this guy does, I think this guy's innocent. But on my own view, some of you might disagree, is that climate change is a scam. It's, it's something that, is, it's a political, it's a socio-political, scientific fraud, which has been developed by the people who want to bring in fundamental changes to this world, which involve the erosion of civil liberties, the erosion of um, independent governments and national sovereignties, the creation of global government, and not democratic, tyrannical government. And the reason they want fewer people in the world is not to save the earth, it's because the model for their society involves fewer people. There would be an elite and the underclass. The world's not overpopulated. It, it appears that way because we've been manipulated into, into living environmentally damaging lives. If you open up a population chart of the Earth, you'll see that most, most of the world is covered by sea. Of the remaining land surface, over half of it is either too mountainous, too cold, too hot. And, and we, I mean, this comes into other areas, into, a lot of, it, a lot of uh, more um, complicated areas, I can't go into detail, but basically there's, there's not, there's, the world could provide everybody on it easily if we had access to technology like free energy, organic, organic hyper-fertilizers like Ormus and Terra Preta. There's plenty of room for everybody, there's plenty of resources for everybody, but it's, it's, a, manipulated, it's a manipulated situation of scarcity they deliberately engineered this so that people like Dr. Hillman will be persuaded that there's something desperately needs to be done in order to save the planet. And this, like, this, this, this guy just, the way he talks is desperation. He says this, I mean, this is really, really chilling. He, de he declares openly that moves towards post democracy will be essential if any real progress is to be made. The United Nations personal carbon allowance must be implemented by force in every nation on Earth. He advocates draconian global regulation of transport for holidays, business and trade. He proposes food rationing. He wants to transform all sectors of the economy so they are geared towards their use of fossil fuels. And when he described it, it actually resembles communism. That's what he's talking about. He says this, and um, the, model, the model he's talking about, he says this, this is a quote. The democratic process is not sacrosanct. The majority view in the developed world is that people are not prepared to make the lifestyle choices for the dramatic carbon reductions necessary, and their, de their democratic leaders do nothing except pander to their whims to get elected. Do we subscribe to the democratic approach to decision making which has so far failed, or in this instance, as I would argue, it has to be set aside? Whether the public like it or not, these changes have to be made. If these changes are not made, we will assuredly hand over a dying planet to succeeding generations. 
That, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly the words the government want to hear from us. Now, this is James Lovelock. He's, a, he's more well known than him. He's a popular scientist. He wrote a book called Gaia, which I read, and it was a best selling book. Very interesting, actually. He's 94 years old. He's still very, very active in, in the environmental movement. And he said this. Even the best democracies agree that when a major war approaches, democracy must be put on hold for the time being. I have a feeling that climate change may be an issue as severe as a war. It may be necessary to put democracy on hold for a while to deal with climate change. That is straight out of the pages of a report from Iron Mountain. Did he read it? Or was he at the meeting? Well, you know, it's, this is... I mean, I don't know, one part of me wants to feel sorry for these people because they have been, the, 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 the things they fear are not real. But I mean, of course, there's a lot of the others. People like Bill Gates, I think, knows very, very well that he's, he's, not, he's not being fooled. He is the one doing the fooling. He's fooling us. And so I have a question for all these bad cops of the environmental protection world. <laughs> Come on, guys. You go after you. Set a good example. Go first. Form an orderly queue. Jump off, beat, beat your head, shoot yourself, throw yourself in front of a train. Do it any way you like. As long as you don't ask us to do it without taking a lead. <laughs> they never do that, do they? It's always somebody else has to die. Somebody, probably, most people who probably consume a lot less than they do. So where do zombies fit into this? Well, it's, the zombie, there could be more than what even Dr. Horowitz has discovered, because the, the, zom the zombie pandemic could be part of this revolution, this change that could bring in this global authoritarian government that they want. And they, they may, it may run deeper than simply the diseases that, um, that Horowitz had talked about. This is the hand of an unfortunate person suffering from Morgellons disease, more Morgellons syndrome. It's a very, very unpleasant condition on which um, the skin becomes, there's extreme, extreme irritation and burning sensations break out underneath the skin, even though the skin is unmarked. Some people scratch, some people don't, but even, whether you scratch or not, they eventually lesions break out and these don't heal over, they, they bleed, they you pus, they become very, very um, unpleasant. But it's not just blood and the, the usual stuff that comes out of wounds that we worry about. These wounds exude material that shouldn't be coming out of our bodies. This, this is a photograph of some of the things that people have found coming out of the wounds when they're suffering from Morgellons disease. It's these little strange fibres. Um, now, if you ask most doctors, they'll say that Morgellons disease doesn't exist. It's basically an act of hysteria. You get people who will think they've got it, and then they'll scratch and they'll get wounds. The wounds will be dressed with cotton fabric, um, the dressings. When you take the dressings off, some little cotton bits of cotton fibre stuck in the scab and that's all these things are. That's what most doctors say. But it's, that's rubbish. These things are not bits of cotton. These things move. They're like little worms. And, and, they, and they seem very strange. You put them in a lighter flame, they won't burn. And other things come out as well, along with these fibres. Um, little tiny little bits of what looks like glass or crystal, various colours. Even little mechanical devices, like little robots come out. And, even small insect-like things come out. It's really, really extremely disturbing, very strange condition, and more and more people are getting it. And luckily, some doctors are now taking it seriously. There's a lady called Sophia Smallstorm who's researched this, and she's linked it to the chemtrail phenomenon. And she says that basically what's happening is the world is being affected by what she calls pseudo-life, which is getting into our bodies. And this is, this is connected with the, what we've been hearing about tonight. The, the aim is to actually create a new, along with this new world order, is a new biological world order. A lot of the uh, chemtrails in over the states have been reported as having uh, like nanotechnology in. Yeah. Um, that may be related to this. No, that's right. They can't. Be. And we've just shown you a new um, uh, spy book, which is online, which is probably the size of a like a small mosquito that could fit really small in, on on your finger. Yeah. And it's, it's fully high-tech nanotechnology. Right, yeah, really, that's, that's... That has the ability to inject something into somebody that lands on. Exactly. This is, under secret technology, it's way above anything they've got in the public domain. I mean, we're talking about a new biological world order as well, which 
And as you said, Cliff Carnegie was the guy who was searching this, and, and uh, John was just saying that the chemtrail actually is huge. The strange precipitation which seems to be linked to this Morgellons, and there's more to it, there's more to what I'm going to come on to. Uh, but, um, this, this, this could result in the new biological world order will mean that natural, natural human life, and maybe animal and plant life as well, will, they want to replace it with something artificial, something they can control. This guy's like Ray Kurzweil, I find him a very annoying individual because he is one of the pioneers of transhumanism, and he, he's very he enthuses about it, he gushes about it, about how it's something wonderful and how it will build a wonderful future for everybody. Transhumanism is the idea that natural, the natural biological body and the mind of humans can be replaced by something artificial, electronics and mechanics. He has an idea that what he wants to do is he wants to build a computer into which we can upload our brains. Transcendence. Yeah. You know, so that's it. And he has there's the 2040 agenda and things like that. Where we're, so our, our mind is inside this computer and it'll be quick, it'll be faster. Um, more, you'll be more intelligent, you'll be able to remember more, and you won't die because this computer will last forever, you can always move it to another hard drive if you want. And we're going to, rather than having human bodies, we'll have mechanical bodies which can run faster, they can last forever, they don't get sick, they don't get tired, etc, etc. And he, he portrays it, he, he, he waxes lyrical about how wonderful it will be. But he's, uh, he's incredibly naive. Because, we're, we're taking into account everything else I've been discussing for this evening, I don't think that the, the elite, as Matt even rightly point out, what the elite have planned in terms of transhumanism may be very different to what um, he, as probably as a kind of ordinary person, envisages. Now, there's another book I recommend as well, which is a book way ahead of its time, a science fiction novel written in 1930, called um, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Because it talks about a, a post transhuman world in which um, Humans are no longer born, they're grown, and they're genetically modified to provide certain functions in society. But in this, this is a very, very different world, because there's a group of elites called the Alphas, and these are these kind of Aryan supermen, immortals, <coughs> highly intelligent, beautiful, perfect and perfect health, long-lived. But they're, not everyone in the world is like them, there's, this, uh, there's these underclasses of workers, there's these epsilons, who are these subhuman, creatures, which only live for 20 years, and they do the menial jobs, they're specifically bred to be unintelligent, they're specifically bred not to have any thoughts of their own or any wish to, to evolve, and that I think is, um, that I think is what we have to be wary of, because Huxley was a member of various um, societies and politics, Huxley, incidentally, what was Huxley, was John Rawls, our school teacher. That's an interesting fact when you think about what books spoke those men Produced. I would love to have been a fly on the wall during the little conversations after class, two of them had, would have had together. I really would. And it goes on, as it goes on. This, um, this is a guy called David Griffin, he's a friend of mine, actually, he's a ufologist. But he's been studying the Falklands War. Um, the Falklands War of 1982 was when um, Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands, which were a British uh, territory. They took it over and Margaret Thatcher's government sent a task force, military task force, to basically sail to the islands and depose the occupation. And of course the government, well, if you listen to the, the, the official story, they, the government always portray it in very, very simplistic and very, very sort of honest and genuine terms. They say things like, well, the people of the Falkland Islands want to remain British and we, we did this for them out of the goodness of our hearts because we cared. Since when does the government do anything out of the goodness of their hearts? Since when do they ever do anything for our benefit because of what we want? No, no, there's a lot more to the Falklands War than that. I mean, I'm interested, I mean, this is kind of an aside, but there's, there's oil fields down there that, was, that were found shortly before the Argentine invasion. If those oil fields had not been found, I don't think Argentina would have been invaded. And I certainly don't think that our government would have bothered going to kick them out. Um, but what David Griffin has discovered is he takes it another step forward because he said that the, the war was actually centred on not on the Falkland Islands, but on an island in the Falkland chain, which is British territory, called Southern Fuel, which is a tiny, rock, icy, rocky um, island, very close to, the, to Antarctica. Um, and he said that there was, there was a base on there, there was an Argentine base on there, it was actually put up in the 70s. And a very, very small base, which was maybe about a couple of dozen people there, a few scientists, uh, a small unit of soldiers, 
And because it was so far away and it was so remote and no one bothered to do anything about it, they just left that and get on with it. But after the Falklands War, this was after the main hostilities had ended, the HMS Endurance, the polar research um, vessel for the Royal Navy, the patrol vessel, sailed to Southern Fuel with some special forces soldiers on board. And these soldiers landed on the island and encircled the Argentine base. These were, these were Royal, Royal Marines special boat squadron. And they demanded the surrender of the Argentine base. Now there was only a couple of dozen guys in there, scientists, a handful of soldiers. Very wisely, the guys in the base did surrender and they were put, taken on board Endurance and repatriated to Argentina. But before the ship left, the Special Forces guy planted a huge explosive device, a mine, on the base. And if you look at the base, it's only two huts, but this blew it sky high, and then the, really, uh, there was a sledgehammer to crack a nut, because the explosive mine they used was far bigger than it should have been. And David Griffin says this is connected to something that was going on on that island at the time which is what he calls sentient fluid or nano oil. And it's very similar to what you might have heard called black goo. And this is a big, this is a big subject, so I can't go into it in any details right now. But according to David Griffin, there's an extraterrestrial connection. I mean, I don't, that doesn't have to be true to, for me to make my point, it's perfectly possible. But also that, um, in, in a nutshell, the black goo has many properties similar to the material that comes from the wounds of people suffering from Morgellons disease. Um, if, I urge you to look that up and learn more about it because it's very, I think there may well be a connection here. So we're talking about transhumanism, changing people into new forms, a political movement to create a, a new form of society in, involving universal, universal authoritarianism and total governmental control. And the way they want to do it is by using biology, biological warfare against us to change us, firstly to kill most of us, to change us into something else. And uh, this brings us back to Resident Evil, because this is, this is one of the most interesting zombie films of all. Um, the Resident Evil films, there's about six of them now, based on a computer game. Uh, this, now what's interesting is, up to a point it's exactly the same as the other sci-fi zombie movies in its basic plot. We have a a virus, a T-virus it's called, which has is, been developed in a secret laboratory by, by an organisation called the Umbrella Corporation. And this is released into the environment and it infects people and they turn into zombies. And of course they bite people, they turn into zombies, etc, etc. Except this woman. This is the main heroine of the series of films, a lady called Alice. Now when she's infected with this virus, she, it has a completely different effect on her. It turns her into a super, superhuman. She becomes somebody who is faster, she can run faster, she's stronger, she's, she can think more quickly, she's sort of transhumanised. And it, it, she actually develops psychic powers later in the, in the series, she develops telekinesis, she can move things with the power of her mind, she can see into the, into the future and things like that. Um, but what's particularly interesting, and someone actually was talking earlier on about this in the break, um, in the third Resident Evil movie, which is called Resident Evil Extinction, um, the Umbrella Corporation is regrouping it, has developed a new base, and it's trying to s say that um, in the post-apocalyptic post world, in the aftermath, when everything's settled down, they can actually use the zombies as slaves, tame slaves, like the Epsilons in Brave New World. And, and this is actually brought up, who was it who talked to me in the break? I'd like to thank you for reminding me of this. Uh, yeah, it was you, John, wasn't it? In, in the film Shaun of the Dead, which is a brilliant uh, zombie comedy, which I talked about earlier. This is actually alluded to, isn't it, in the, in the, in the end of the film, although it's done with, with a humorous way. So that's, um, in conclusion, I think it's the, the zombie issues connected with all this in a kind of way I'm not quite certain of yet. At the same time, you have to, I'll just touch briefly on this, I'm nearly finished now. We have to touch on the possibility of literal supernatural zombies. I think that can't be, dismissed, and it may be that it's not either or. If there are real supernatural zombies being created by occult paranormal practices, then it's not either or. It could maybe, may very well be in conjunction with the, the zombie created by disease. Now, as I said, there's the original zombies come from West Africa, from shamanic traditions, but there's a Western occult tradition of zombie-like 
um, themes as well. For instance, I'm going to read, this is a passage from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the oldest stories recorded ever. It actually dates back to the, to the uh, fourth millennium BC, the end of the fourth millennium BC, and it's from Sumeria. And this is, listen to this. I will knock down the gates of the nether world. I will smash the doorposts and leave the doors to fall flat down. And I will let the dead go up and eat the living, and the dead will outnumber the living. Now that's, that's from the, a story that is over 5,000 years old. And there's um, in Kabbalistic Jewish folklore, there's a story of the golem. Of golem spelled G-O-L-E-M, which may be where J.R. Tolkien got the idea for Gollum, the creature from Lord of the Rings. Because J Tolkien knew an awful lot of stuff. I'll tell you what, he really did, J.R. Tolkien. He had access to a lot of very, very ancient spiritual knowledge. And there's also, um, really, the, the story of the, the Gollum, or Gollum, it, it's similar to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is technically a science fiction movie, but it has elements of these things. It's about bringing dead matter to life through these Kabbalistic spells. In, in the book, it's, he uses electricity, the Dr. Victor Frankenstein, the character. He creates a living being from dead flesh using electricity. So what I'm saying is that the, the elite, the Illuminati, whatever you want to call them, they, they may be able to turn dead bodies into zombies through supernatural means, as well as biological, technological, and heavy industrial methods. It's not either or. They may very well use both. Why would they do that? I don't know. I mean, I don't know why they would want to do these things because why they want to create this new world order of authoritarian global government. Why they want to change this planet, the humans, black animals, plants, into some genetically modified monster. I don't know. It's, it's the answer lies inside their heads. I don't particularly want to look. I'm not interested in why so much as what they're doing. I think that's what counts. I mean, we don't want it. It's bad. Whatever it is, it's bad news for us. But... Really, I mean, even though what I've spoken about tonight is, is very disquieting, it's very worrying, and I know, I'm sorry if any of you have been disturbed by what I've talked about this evening, but you know, I think that um, however horrific this information is, it wouldn't be half as horrific if this information was not getting out. Because I think if enough people know about this, they won't get away with it, they can't. And people, we, we've got to be on the ball here, I think. It's definitely, definitely the case. And I think... There's, there's Sophia Smallstorm, the lady who talks about Morgellons disease. She says that there's hope in the fact that people are getting Morgellons disease because she believes that this is the body's immune system fighting back against this, this transhumanist uh, pseudo-life. It's actually, your body's actually rejecting this transhumanist pseudo-life. So more and more people are getting Morgellons disease. Maybe they're the lucky ones. And the more, maybe the rest of us will get it. <laughs> and I think there is hope. I think I've got to miss it. I mentioned J.R. Tolkien, author of Lord of the Rings, who knew, had access to deep spiritual knowledge. His character, Gandalf, said, Some believe it is only great power that can hold evil in check. But that's not what I have found. I have found that it is the small everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and love. And what, this, what he's saying here is that we are not helpless just because we don't have our own secret laboratories, we don't have our own methods of physically stopping this, these people. We mustn't give up, we must not, we must not surrender to, um, to despair. Another thing that he says in, in, in Lord of the Rings is he's talking to Frodo the Hobbit and he says, um, there are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. And there are. You must, we must not feel as if we are just this trap. Because, I mean, it's very easy to think that when you... When you I, I thought that at times. There's just nothing we can do. It's just too overwhelming. This conspiracy is too powerful to be defeated. It's not. Now, this guy, I mean, I'll... Um, this guy here, Lyle Watson, interesting scientist. I'll, just, I'll be finished in a minute, but I just want to tell you about this guy, because he... He used to study monkeys. He was an open-minded scientist. He was into spiritual. He got into the, he discovered the African tradition and everything like that. And he just he studied monkeys on an island. And he found out the monkeys that eat potatoes. They used to dig potatoes up and eat them. And one of the monkeys one day decided to wash the potato in the sea to see. What, and he bit into it. He realised that washing it in the sea with the salt improved the flavour. 
some of the other monkeys watched the first monkey doing it and they went and they copied it and they and they thought, mm, yeah, and so more and more of them tried it. More and more of them tried it that way. And before I know you said it wouldn't happen. <laughs> um, more and more of them tried it that way. And before you know it, um, they, a lot of them very, very quickly learned. They, re they reached a point, a critical mass, when suddenly you, every, all the monkeys in all the islands seemed to know how to do it, even the ones who hadn't learned the normal way. And what Watson said was that uh, uh, once a level of knowledge is, is present in enough of a large enough proportion of the population, it, it leads into the, so, so, um, the collective unconscious, what Carl, Carl Jung, the psychologist, called the collective unconscious, which is the, the uh, part of our minds which is shared with everybody else. And he says, once it's there, that knowledge is accessible to all members of that population, even if they haven't ac accessed it through normal sensory perception. And he said that the actual proportion, the actual level, the ratio, was nowhere near a minority. He said with monkeys, it was just 1% of monkeys. Once 1% of monkeys knew something, all the rest of them would know it. And that's where you get the phrase, the hundredth monkey effect. Now with humans, we don't know what that proportion is. It may be less than the monkeys, it may be more. But we're, right now, we might be on the threshold of that hundredth monkey, right this moment. You, or one of you sitting in this audience, might be the hundredth monkey. Could that be why they want to depopulate? Yeah, maybe, that's right. Good, good point, John. Um, so we mustn't give up, and do remember that um, we... We must, we move, if we were on the threshold, we, if we gave up the moment before we get the 100th monkey, the perpetrators of this atrocity would be laughing at us for centuries. So please, don't, never give up, keep going. Martin Luther King said, this hour in history needs a dedicated circle of transformed non-conformists. Our planet teeters on the brink of annihilation, dangerous passions of pride, hatred and selfishness are enthroned in our lives. And men do revenge before reverence before false gods of nationalism and materialism. The, um, the saving of our world from pending doom will come not through the complacent adjustment of the conforming majority, but through the creative maladjustment of the non-conforming non -conforming minority. That's very true. It's the non-conforming minority. So you, you may feel like you're a mi non-conforming minority, and you are. We all are. But that's, a, that's something to celebrate, because we're the ones where all the power lies. And don't take life too seriously, okay? If you let this get to you too much, you, you know, it can overwhelm you. I've been there, I'll tell you. I need time out, I need to laugh. I need to, I need to remember, as Oscar Wilde said, always forgive your enemies because nothing annoys them so much. <laughs> and as the late great Mahatma Gandhi said, when I was there, I remember that all through history, the ways of truth and love have always won. There have been tyrants and murderers, and for a time, they can seem invincible, but in the end, they always fall. Think of it. Always. And if I had another two hours, I could talk more about this subject, about why I think we're in with a chance, and I think why there's hope in this world, but I don't have another two hours. I think I don't have, much, I don't have another minute, I don't think that's it. And as they say in Crime Watch, don't have nightmares. Thank you very much.